the questions just copied and pasted onto a Word file. So if I have any additional notes um, or if I have anything that is what I think is helpful to you, um, what I'll end up doing is I will put that on Moodle um, and so that you guys can see that. So I have my chat up. So if you have any questions, um, it's right here. Um, I can see you, if you type to me or if you type to everybody. Um, so I'm going to leave that up. And um, uh, I'll share my notes only if it's something that's going to add to it. Right now, these are just copied and pasted from the question forum. So we have four questions today. Um, the first question is from Brittany, so I'll tackle that one first. Um, and so she asks about EEGs. And so it uh, looks like she's uh, had an EEG conducted, so she's familiar with um, how they work. Um, let's see. Um, or she says from uh, family and friends having EEGs done. So, um, and her question is about uh, unfamiliar versus familiar environments. So, um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about EEG is that, so it does me measure brain waves and it measures. Um, for polysomnography or PSG, it is really limited in terms of what it can measure. So in a typical polysomnography EEG, you have maybe 10 electrodes, and those electrodes are measuring various points on the scalp. And it's more so looking for things like synchrony <clears throat> and desynchrony, <clears throat> excuse me, to see um, generally what's going on kind of as a whole in your brain. Um, so it's not very good at saying, well, this particular area of the brain is doing this. It's more of saying these brain waves tell us that the majority of your brain is in alpha waves, therefore you must be, you know, sleepy um, or relaxed. Um, and with the brain waves saying that you're showing alpha waves, plus with the electrodes measuring your neck, uh, your neck is extremely relaxed, completely relaxed, and you're you know, showing alpha waves, therefore you must be in REM sleep. Um, so the EEG is really primarily used just for staging, and it's just to kind of see what is the brain doing and what is that telling us in terms of what, what stage of sleep that you're in. Now, that is different from when you go to a doctor, and let's say you're being monitored because you had a seizure, or if you had something uh, where they want to monitor your brain activity and they want to see different parts of your brain. They are not interested in the whole brain as a whole. They're interested in all of it. Um, they're interested in, in um, you know, the sections of the brain and, and what's going on from one part of the brain to the next. So for example, if you had a seizure, they'll want to know where is the seizure starting and where does it move across your brain. So in that case, you would actually have a lot more electrodes and the electrode placement um, would be a lot closer together so that you can kind of get a bigger picture of the different parts of the brain. So you might go to a doctor and they might put 128 electrodes on your, on your scalp versus the 10 that you get for polysomnography. So they're going to be able to see what's going on in your brain and the electrical activity a whole lot better than polysomnography. Polysomnography EEG is just used for staging of um, what stage of sleep that you're in. So when it comes to familiar versus unfamiliar environment, they're not interested, sleep scientists aren't interested in what's going on at the points of the electrodes necessarily um, to see a difference between what does your brain do when you're in unfamiliar versus familiar environment. They're just interested in what are the brain waves doing at that point in time. And honestly, the difference that you see between familiar and unfamiliarity really comes into how quickly you can fall asleep. So if you're in, in an unfamiliar environment, like you're in a sleep lab, you're in an unfamiliar bed, you're, you're hooked up to the electrodes and they're testing to see what stage you, that you're in, you're going to be, it's going to be harder for you, depending on your situation, possibly to fall asleep because you're in an unfamiliar environment. Whereas if you're at home in your own bed in a familiar environment, the brain waves don't change from, from, from um, situation to situation. It's just you go into them faster 
or you might be in the, you might be in stages longer because you're more comfortable. Um, so you're getting better sleep. It's not as disrupted. And they do actually, there are companies that do have really good at home sleep study uh, equipment. So it's, you know, there, there might be fewer electrodes or, um, you know, the placement might be slightly different. Um, you would basically have somebody come to your house or come to you, set you all up. And then, um, it's, a um, what they call, um, it's a, um, thing of the word uh you take it with you i i blanked on the word um it's it's the equipment that you can can um that it's not you know stuck in a lab so you can take it with you portable portable is what we're looking for it's portable equipment so essentially what it is is you can wear it it's you're hooked to yourself and to to the um equipment to yourself you don't have like things that the wires are going to um it's kind of all contained you do that and then you wake up and then you take all the electrodes off and then you kind of put it in a bag and you give it to the researcher and so those are really good because they really capture uh sleep in a familiar environment, but you don't have anybody monitoring you. So although that's good because you might get better sleep without somebody watching you, but if something happens during the night to the equipment, you have no way, no one knows and can fix it like immediately. So you might have lost data. Um, it's not as reliable just because it's the equipment's not as good as that you get in the sleep lab. And there's, you know, there's some pros and cons. It's, it's, it can be cheaper in some cases to do that. And sometimes in the grand scheme of things, more expensive because you need more kits. Um, it just depends. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where uh, the EEG itself isn't really familiar versus unfamiliar is not really changing. It's just a matter of how comfortable are you and how easily can you fall asleep. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, and let me know if you have anything that's, um, that I didn't answer. Um, okay. So um, Madeline had a question about um, predators. So sleep. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks, Brittany. <laughs> She's on chat. So awesome. Um, let's see. So Madeline had a question about sleep and avoidance of predators. Um, so like she says, common sense would suggest that animals are vulnerable to predict predators while asleep, but there are species that, you know, make um, nests, you know, fortify themselves, nest dens, caves, and to help evade predators. So um, the question is, is about diurnal sleep patterns of primates and whether or not this may indicate that humans and other primates' evolutionary ancestors evolved to be diurnal in order to evade nocturnal predators. Um, I think that's a very good observation and very likely one of the main reasons why humans and primates are diurnal. Um, so when you look at sort of the, the, the history of uh, you know, evolution, and, and you look at kind of the idea behind uh, the early mammals, there's some some work to suggest that early mammals were actually nocturnal, um, and that's because they were evading uh, diurnal uh, predators like reptiles. So, you know, reptiles are cold-blooded, they need the sunlight uh, to maintain a body temperature, so they're, you know, around during the day, and so early mammals likely were nocturnal to avoid those predators. Um, it's very difficult to say if humans evolved to become diurnal because of the way that our bodies are. Is it because to evade, uh, to, um, because hunting is what we hunt and what we what we gather and what we eat is available and easier to spot during the day, um, or it's just sort of a combination of everything. So, as we've learned in the circadian rhythm lectures, um, what you find is that you know humans are are the, our body clock is set by sunlight, um, so we need sunlight in order for us to function properly. But humans are also very adaptable. So even though early humans came from Africa, they migrated and moved uh, all over the place. And so we find that those areas where we move to, those different latitudes, um, those humans have evolved uh, 
to adapt to those situations. Um, so, you know, in areas where light is different. So in Africa, you know, you're looking at, you know, 12 hours light, 12 hours dark. There are other areas of the world that don't get as much light uh, that might go through months of darkness. For example, like we're talking like Alaska and, the, and, and those areas. Um, and humans have evolved to, to, or have adapted to stay in those environments for, for a very long time. Um, so we are very adaptable, but it's very difficult to find, uh, to figure out the exact cause, the reason why we're diurnal. Uh, you know, we have poor eyesight at night. Um, is that a result of or a cause of being diurnal? Um, you know, we developed color vision probably so that we can spot things like berries and so that our, um, you know, food sources are easily spotable. So we see, you know, differences in primate uh, in brains of those primates who are able to, uh, or uh, I should say, in, in this case, monkeys, there are certain monkeys, um, compared to other kinds of animals uh, in their color vision and being able to spot different, you know, food types. Um, so we have this idea that, um, you know, our eyesight is poor at night. We seem to operate better and hunt better during the day and gather better during the day. Um, our body responds to sunlight in a way that we need it during the day or during the morning, whereas there are other animals and other, al like for example, algae that respond to sunlight that needs sunlight certain times for photosynthesis. So different species have evolved a certain way uh, to need sunlight or nighttime for, for different varying reasons. I would say that probably part of a huge reason why we're diurnal is to avoid those predators just like you you theorized there um and then very likely everything else kind of moved with that so we might have had better sight at night in in a certain situation if you know at one point we were we were nocturnal um but i think a lot of the evidence points to us pretty much always being diurnal. Um, but that's an interesting question. And there's a lot of factors to consider there. Uh, most of them falling under the category of, um, are we a product of, uh, of this? Or is this a, a result? Is this a result of this or a cause of this? And I think that that's a really, really difficult question to answer. Um, when you don't have all, when you don't have all of the pieces to the puzzle in terms of, of the history of human evolution, um, so hopefully that answers your question. It was, it's you know it's difficult to say. Um, it's kind of the chicken or egg debate in some in some cases, um, but that's pretty much you know, I, I would agree with you that that's probably a big reason why we're diurnal. Um, let's see, Chelsea uh, asked a question about bullfrogs. So this was this is an interesting question, and I think I touch on this in the lecture um, that's posted, um, or at least I've, I've, I know that I do this in class um, when I teach this face-to-face. -face. So this all kind of stems to two major things. One is our definition of sleep. So that's one of, I believe that's one of your forum questions for you guys to talk about is, how do you guys feel about what we've defined sleep as? Uh, is it appropriate? It, does it cover everything that we need to cover in terms of different species and different types of sleep and, and all that? Um, and there is no really good definition of sleep that encompasses everything. So if we look at the definition of sleep, according to the, that one article that I posted, um, that really is one of the only articles to really look at bullfrog sleeping patterns, um, or at least the, 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 the only one that I'm aware of, you know, they, in the one study, they suggest that the patterns that they discovered did not match our current definition of sleep. Um, according to those researchers, they said bullfrogs do not sleep. Um, now, they do do rest periods uh, where I would argue would be probably sleep if we re-examine the bullfrog and if we really look at um, the factors that uh, that are at play. But uh, so my guess is that bullfrogs probably do sleep. If they don't quote unquote sleep per our definition, they absolutely have some sort of rest or torpor or something that mimics sleep and is probably evolutionarily designed to allow them to maximize survival. Um, so 
And, you know, there are other animals that do things that look like sleep, but aren't, that doesn't meet our definition, but they're still involved. They're still doing some sort of rest that is going to conserve energy and it's going to change, uh, you know, their uh, state. And so, you know, that I think is essential in, uh, in most species. Um, and if, in and, and, you know, there are definitely some, some weird versions of that, that are, that are kind of beyond what, you know, humans do, what mammals do, but those different animals have reasons for, you know, probably to evade predators or to, you know, conserve energy or there's low food source or something like that in order to, uh, avoid, um, in order to be able to to continue to survive. So my argument is we shouldn't rely on one study for bullfrogs to 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 come to this conclusion. So my answer is that I'm not I I don't love the idea of saying that bullfrogs don't sleep. Now, according to the literature, to the research, to what we know, if I ask you a question on a test that says what's the one animal that we say that doesn't sleep? bullfrogs would be it. But I would argue that there's probably a lot more there. We have better technology now to to examine bullfrog sleep. And I think that there should be definitely more work done in that area. Because I think that our opinion might change, or maybe our definition might might change a little bit in terms of, of what we consider sleep and not. Um, okay, so the final question is from Kyle. This is kind of a, okay, so I'll admit, I've actually changed this slide since since I've posted it. Um, I don't have, I don't believe I have the new version on here, but um, just because I, I I see how it can get confusing, because where I talk about in the intro sleep lecture PowerPoint, I say each type of sleep is demonstrated by different EEG patterns, and sleep, and I put this does not equal not awake. Um, and what I mean here is that sleep is not the opposite of wake in terms of EEG. So this is kind of, it's, it's easier to explain. This is one of those slides that I like to explain versus just have kind of there. Um, what you do when you're asleep is very different in terms of your brain activity from when you're awake. Um, it's not that system shut down. It's not that they all work in reverse. It's, it's, it's not the opposite of wake. So when you think of sleep EEG, what you should be thinking of is, is this is a whole new category of brain activity. This is separate from awake. It is not the same as awake. It's not the opposite of awake. It's not the reverse. It's not a system shutdown. What your brain does while you sleep is it uses the systems and the cells that you have in a different way. So there are systems that work kind of in reverse. There are systems that uh, we see, you know, different kinds of neurotransmitters being released at different times, um, different systems working together that don't work together when you're awake. And so think of, the brain on, brain off, brain awake, brain asleep as two different brains. It's using everything the same way, um, but in different different time points. And it's using it. So you know your chemicals in your brain, the cells, the structures, the locations, all of that is the same, right? You're using the same materials in a different way in different combinations. And that's what's giving us things like dreaming. That's what's doing memory consolidation. There are certain things that you do in your sleep that you just simply do not do when you're awake. One example of that is cleanup. So for example, when, you, when your body clears its waste, it uses this lymphatic system. Okay. And so that is a way for you to get rid of all the junk. Um, you know, when cells produce waste in your body, it moves through the lymphatic system and it moves out and, and is ex excreted, expelled, whatever. Your brain does not have a lymphatic system. And so while you're awake and while you're conscious and moving around, it can't clear waste. 
it does that process while you're asleep using your cerebral spinal fluid and using your aqueducts and those avenues. And so when you're asleep, your brain's able to take whatever waste is generated from the cells in your brain and remove that during the process of sleep. And it doesn't do that while you're awake, or at least the research right now suggests that it only happens while you sleep. So there are processes that happen when we wake and processes happen that when we sleep. And those are not the opposite, reverse. They're not the same. Um, certain systems in your brain, certain pathways only work one direction when you wake, may work a different direction when you sleep, or may work in combination with another system or another pathway. Um, and the, the comment about the idea behind clearing waste while you sleep is actually an argument for why people who are chronic short sleepers who are just simply not getting enough sleep tend to be more likely to develop Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's is a disease where we see excess waste in the brain. So this is a very simple theory to say those individuals who aren't getting enough sleep aren't letting their brains do the clearing of the waste during sleep. When you're depriving yourself of sleep, you're depriving yourself of allowing your brain to remove that waste. And it builds and it builds. And over 20, 30, 40 years, what you see is that buildup may result in something like uh, you know, plaques and tangles and tows. And that buildup, that protein buildup, could result in disease like Alzheimer's and, and other uh, dementia related, like um, there's other dementias that are related to, uh, to um, this, this waste buildup. So um, I, I, I hope that answered your question and cleared that slide up a little bit. Um, I know it's not the best worded slide, but that's kind of one that works best when I can kind of walk through it. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up. So um, does anybody have any questions who's on the chat? If you don't, then, and if you think of something, you can always send me an email um, and I'm happy to clarify. Or if I need to do a follow-up, I'm happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> so if there's no uh, uh, additional questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the lecture. I'm going to um, save this. Uh, I'm recording it now and I'll post it on Moodle within the next day or two. So you guys can go back and view it if you need to, or if you missed the live lecture, you're able to, to get that information. So hope everybody has a good day and I will see you next week.